This is the Lean Construction Blogs Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories, case studies, and lessons learned of applying lean construction from around the world. Join Dick Beyer as he interviews industry leaders, lean construction practitioners, and subject matter experts to help you improve the build environment in general and your design and construction projects in particular, advance your lean journey, and bring your continuous improvement efforts to the next level. Let's get started. Hey gang, welcome to the podcast. I'm Dick Beyer. Welcome back. Hopefully you have been listening to some or watching some of our podcasts and enjoying them. If you do, score it wherever uh, your vehicle is for watching it. Give us a big thumbs up. I'm really excited about today's podcast. Uh, The truth is I'm really excited about all of the podcasts. But today we get to spend some time with Todd Zabel. Todd Zabel was an original founder of LCI, along with Greg Howell and Glenn Ballard and the crew back in the day. And he has been single-mindedly focused on productivity throughout his career. So he was the first guy that I ever really spoke deeply about productivity with. And uh, he has been uh, just a legend in that area. So without further ado, let's move over and introduce my friend, Todd Zabel. Uh, I think of Todd as the king of productivity. And usually I put some uh, more emphasis in front of productivity because uh, in our community, lots of people think about predictability and reliability and camaraderie and collaboration and cooperation. But uh, ever since I met Todd 20 years ago-ish, he's been the guy that's really focused on productivity. So I'm so glad to have you here, my friend. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Dick. Seems like it'll be a fun time and we can maybe do three things, talk about some of the old days when, when LCA was launched and what thinking back then, maybe a little bit on this idea of uh, productivity and production, and then finally maybe take a look at where we think things might be headed and, and maybe tickle some, uh, some vision well, of what's get, out there. Yeah, let's get started. Um, and I'm, I'm really actually excited about the three years because I love that uh, progression that you've designed. So that's a little tease for folks coming up. Well, let's start with uh, let's start with you. So, um, where are you from? Where did you grow up? How did you uh, get into the business? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I'm actually sitting here not far from where I grew up, but I was uh, born and raised here in the Bay Area, born in San Francisco, and um, I fell into this back in the uh, in the contracting days when I was trying to figure out how to make uh, more profit, for lack of a better word and read numerous books on project management, more the administrative stuff as we would might call it, and uh, ran into Martin Fisher, who was doing his PhD at the, sta- at the time at Stanford in 91, out of all things, a Primavera uh, seminar. And uh, Martin and I became, became friends and he introduced me to a whole new world that was out there that was just beginning to evolve then. It was very, very early days. Costco was doing his robotic research at SIFI. Martin was doing his 3D, 4D stuff. And uh, across the bay, there were some things starting to happen at, at Berkeley, and it all came together. It was an amazing time, if you will. Yeah, that's, that's pretty fantastic. So how long had you been in construction before you realized that you might need some uh, other resources? Or actually, it doesn't surprise me that you'd be supplementing your knowledge on a regular basis. <laughs> Um, well, uh, I always like to tell a story where when I was in high school, someone offered me a job where I could work out, get tan and get paid. And I thought that was unbelievable. <laughs> Next thing I know, I was doing some manual labor. But really, uh, I started working probably in about 1985. And then 88 is when I really started going on the journey of trying to figure out, especially with, uh, at the time I was working for a company, we had union direct hire laborers or craft workers, I should say. And you know, they got quite expensive. As a matter of fact, when I started the construction company in 93, it was actually more cost effective for us to hire engineers, uh, graduates out of Berkeley and Stanford than it was to hire union iron workers and other types of workers, believe it or not. Wow, that's amazing. Because uh, I started as a union uh, sheet metal worker, actually, uh, in the trades the first summer out of high school. And I quickly learned that it would be a lot easier if I wore a tie every day. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the, some of the stuff you sent me, I noticed that you wrote a paper in 1988 already about, you know, VD, virtual design and construction and, uh, 
and modeling. Tell us a little bit about what what got you going into that. Was it just that you you had a company and you thought, yeah, this is it's got to be a better way of doing this? Yeah, that's exactly it. And and again, you know, you're talking back there in the day, direct hire guys anywhere fifty something bucks an hour, and uh, my. I, I, at that time, and I think this is really important for people, and, and I was talking about this in an interview the other day, I, I truly believed it was about people and motivation. And I didn't really have the production perspective um, that came later. And so I thought if you could motivate the workers to work harder, that would be a really good thing. And they'd get things done faster. And of course, you would have better productivity. And so it's kind of this, uh, we'll talk about the three errors of the myth, but really this Frederick Taylor scientific management perspective of it's all about the dumb worker. And how do you make them work harder? Uh, what I began to see through Martin originally was the power of putting together things digitally uh, using three-dimensional computer modeling, four-dimensional visualization, and identifying the problems in advance and working those out in advance, and ultimately getting to the point where we were basically putting together kits of parts. And it got to the point, I remember the highlight was probably a project that we did as a subcontractor for Dinwiddie at Embarcadero Center. And we had the uh, lumber yard pre-cut all the lumber for blocking we had to do. And the carpenters union was upset because they'd never seen anything like that. And the lumber yard said, yeah, as long as you place the order, we'll cut all the lumber for free. And we sent them over out of the 3D model. We pushed out the exact dimensions of every piece we needed. And it came up palletized in the sequence that needed to be installed. And uh, it, was, it was an exciting time. But that was really the, the, the gist of it. And then from there, you could really see where all this could go. Because if you could do the integration, coordination, and visualization of the work, it was, had a huge impact. And then the automated bill of materials. And as we moved into the assembly drawings, it got really interesting too, because you were finding all sorts of issues that you could avoid in the, in the field. And you know what? Actually, the workers were more motivated because they didn't have to solve problems, right? They got to do work, right? Well, you know, a lot of the work around motivation, the Daniel Pink stuff uh, about intrinsic motivation, about autonomy, doing a good day's work and looking back on on having successfully done something in a day. I mean, what industry is better than ours? I mean, if you had to sit around um, an insurance company and answer 700 emails and you look back at the end of the day, what would you look at? Yes, I <laughs> you know? did the day before. Not another, not 150 feet of lineal sure. uh, duct work that you installed, sure. you know? Um, you and Martin had a really great observation in one of your papers that you wrote together uh, that I thought, why don't people think about this? And it was the time it takes people to take a two-dimensional drawing and create a 3D image in their mind. And why wouldn't you just go to the 3D image in the model? Because everybody creates a different image in their mind from that 2D drawing. And yet people are so wedded to that. Even today, it's just like, you know, get your horse off the road, get yourself a small little vehicle, friends. <laughs> you know? Well, there was actually some research that, Mon that Martin had done at Stanford with a couple of his PhD students at the time. And one was, how much time did it take or does it take to get aligned on what it is we're both looking at? You think you're looking at one thing. I think we we're looking at another thing, but they're exactly the same thing we're both thinking about. And if you, if you really want to test this out, uh, we have a speaker come every year named Neil Seth, who's a neuroscientist from the UK. And there's a great study that he showed us, and I don't know if you've seen it or not, maybe some of the, the, the viewers at some point have seen that, on the blue dress, gold dress. Mm. And it's the same dress and half the population thinks it's blue and the other half thinks it's gold. And they figured out it has to do with how much time that you spent outside. But we had about 150 people in the room at a conference. He put that thing up. I thought it was blue. 60% of the room thought it was gold. And we were all completely aligned to what we saw until right. he said, how many you see blue and how many see gold? And the room gasped. Because we all saw the same thing until he asked. It's funny what that aha moment is, where you realize that, you know, your your mind is playing tricks on you. It's interesting what you said about, you know, trying to get the workers motivated and working harder. I've been on so many projects that where the superintendent is trying to get the work done faster. And one of the great things about the airplane game or the make a card game, which is my kind of favorite go-to game, is that when the make a card game, you know, you take dots off a piece of paper and you put it on a card and you try to and, and you produce them under constraints until you're released to produce it as the, as the team decides. You can never take the dot off the paper any faster. What you can do is you can cut down the space between the work. And nobody ever thinks about the space between the work. They only think about, well, just do the work faster. And really, there's a physical limit to what, how quickly you can do work. 
but there's almost no limit to how you can take those spaces between when people are working and when they're not. You're just a legend in the community. So I appreciate you being on here for that as well. But you were back there in the day of the, of the first LCI kind of meeting in Houston. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, and I don't know if a lot of people know this, but LCI was actually founded as a for-profit business. And uh, Glenn Ballard at the time had, uh, you know, basically what happened to go a little bit further back, I think this is important for people to have the context. Um, Martin and I were involved in something called the Northern California Construction Institute. We did, a, we, every year, uh, NCCI would do two conferences or seminars a year. And Martin and I had the one in Monterey. And they said, hey, you guys go down there and uh, figure out what we could do. It's, good. it's, it's an important one because it's the weekend one. So make sure the people come. And we did something on emerging trends or technologies in construction. And we had some crazy people talk about crazy stuff. But this one guy gets up there and he says, how many of you have thought about your planning system lately, right? And that happened to be Glenn Ballard in the first presentation of what would become Last Planner. Because Last Planner was actually coined by some guys that worked at Mace in the UK I was over there on a visit and they said, we're doing last planner. I go, what do you mean you're doing last planner? That's not a thing, right? Came back and Greg, Greg, and, Greg and Glenn and I met. So let's just call it that. They've already, someone else has termed it. You know, Greg's kind of got, why argue with them? So <laughs> what, what was interesting is, is this whole thing launches and, and Glenn actually came to work for the construction company had time Pacific contracting on a part-time basis, which was really cool to have him roaming around the office. Right. And, okay. uh, there's some great stories I could tell you about that, and uh, but we'll leave that for another day. But you know, Glenn walks in one day and says, "I'm starting an institute." I go, oh, "That's pretty cool. What is it?" Well, it's going to be the Lean Construction Institute, and that goes back to again the work that was happening in Sci-Fi with Koskala and, and this question: Does the new production paradigm, as he had read in the Machine that Change the World, apply? And Glenn said, "I want to go further. This we started the international group, but we're going to start something locally." And, and the thesis was back then for for the group: you know, we're tired of solving problems. Let's fix them in advance, you know, kind of a novel idea. So the first meeting happened in Houston. There's five guys there. And I'll, the highlight was Leo Lindbeck may have been there. Steve Chappell from uh, Coke Industries was there. A guy from Brown and Root was there. And then Glenn and Greg and I, I believe. And may, maybe one other person. And this was the best part of the whole meeting. These, these guys, were, we're trying to, for lack of a better word, sell these guys and get involved. And uh, the guy from Brown and Root says, okay, I, I, what is it you people want? I said, well, we want five grand from everybody so we can go do research. And the guy looked at us and said, you can't do anything for five grand. When you want 500, give us a call. And he walked out, right? And it was just classic. And it didn't make sense. Hey, wait a second. We'll take 500. <laughs> well, but, but I'll tell you what, what, what was talked about the group, with, uh, especially Glenn, was we don't want 500 because then we might as well go to work for them. We don't want to be holding to them. Right. And, and one other key thing that a lot of people don't know about LCI is, the idea was to sunset it in 2007. Glenn right. said, this thing will be dead. We're, we're shooting it in 2007 because we would have figured out whatever we need to figure out. Now, you know, with, we didn't have the 500, so maybe we didn't figure it out. But anyway. Well, it's, it's, it's the nature of um, associations. I blame myself for, uh, for taking over, you know, Greg's request, Greg and Glenn's request, jumping in to be the executive director and then all of a sudden it just took on a life of its own and i'm afraid it'll never die no matter how many problems it solves <laughs> I, I think it's it's you know it's doing its thing and, and there's a need for that and there's got to be something to counteract some of the other let's say efforts that are going on out there uh, doing whatever it is they do so i think it's a, it's a good thing that it, it does its thing yeah it's and, a, uh, did a hell of a job with it so you know you should be well, congratulated for that I appreciate that. But when I was done evangelizing and, and they had to have an HR department and insurance, <laughs> it's like, let's go find somebody who knows about that stuff. I, that's not yeah. what I want to do. I want to just get out there and keep kind of banging around at it. Early on, you had Brandon Root. You had your own business, Pacific Contracting. You said that uh, in discussions with me, TD Mechanical was an early adopter. Neenan and Greeley uh, was an early adopter. And then Lindbeck, whether it was Leo or his son, Henry, or Chuck Greco. I know that those guys were, uh, you know, instrumental pretty early on thinking about the changes. What were, what was their interest? Were, were they dissatisfied with the, that, that group of people? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, a little bit more context on what happened there. TD was interesting because, and again, there's a group of people that's really interesting and I don't know why they don't come together and have a meeting, but there's a group that, and this is kind of a side story, but I think it's related. There's a group of people that graduate out of Stanford who's Martin Fisher, Iris Tomlin at Berkeley, Vic Sanvita, who's going to be part of this story in a minute, yep. uh, Mike Williams, who went to Bechtel, 
Norm Barnes, who went to work for his dad's company, actually introduced Lean to Sutter, where him and I were in there making this presentation, and Will Lichtig was sitting there, and, uh, and, and Todd Aris is down there, Len Lease now, and, and many others. And it was an amazing time on what that happened. The, the TD guys ran into them at a DBIA conference where Sam Vito was presenting his research on why design build was more effective than conventional fix some uh, hard money, if you will, right? Yeah, and he did so, that with uh, Mark Concher, one of his one of his kids. Exactly. And so that that got going, one of the early uh, deployments of it. Neenan was very interesting uh, because we had met them at a conference that Womack was doing for uh, the Lean Enterprise Institute with, uh, with Daniel Jones. And just a little side story there, I always think was funny, is he was going to have 2,000 people and Lockheed said, we'll take 2,300. And uh, he said, you, no, you can't have that many, but we'll settle on 1,500. So they took the 500 grand. They were smart. But anyways, <laughs> uh, and so we did this construction thing, and that's where we ran into uh, to Hal Maycumber, who had just come from ABB at the time. And, uh, and they were doing some interesting things on their schematic design in a day, which I think still has a lot of power. And then finally, um, Leo is just a guy that is a really sharp guy that looks at construction more than the actual design and and uh, con a physical construction part and looks at the business aspect along with a great joke that I'll never forget about uh, being the customer and how that all works on whether you're going to heaven or hell. And that's a separate story, but a great joke. I'll never forget Leo talking, telling us one day. So really cool group. And at the same time, you know, the Brits came in from, from Heathrow Terminal 5 and you have uh, what John Egan was doing over there in the UK and uh, that's really where things started to take off. The early days was what, what happened on, on Heathrow and, and that whole effort. Yeah, what's interesting is that from the Egan Commission report and uh, a lot of that stuff, a lot of stuff that um, Brent Flyberg writes about and talks about it uh, at the Said School at Oxford. Uh, it's funny that they kind of went in a different contractual direction. They didn't really do an IFOA. They have a kind of partnering agreement that came out of that. Why is it that whenever people look at a problem, they think that a contract is going to solve it somehow? That's really, as a lawyer, <laughs> you know, my deep question. Yeah, I'd even go further. And uh, I learned this at one point. All a contract really is, is the potential rules of engagement that will be, no, that will be negotiated if there's a potential legal action. So the first thing the attorneys do is they begin to interpret the contract and it gets to the point you're an attorney, you know a hell of a lot more than I do. We need, to, we need to verify and validate the signatures on the contract to even see if we have a contract, right? Is one of the first moves, yeah, right? Oh my God, right? Yeah, and so you're sitting, so to me, a contract is merely the real rules of engagement in, in, the, in the instance of, in the highly unlikely event, we're, and maybe in construction it's likely, that we're going to have an issue that we need to get courts or uh, arbitrators or you know, mediators involved. And so I don't know why people spend so much time on these documents um, other than uh, they, they maybe they don't know what else to do. Right. Yeah. Maybe they don't really know. Well, I think, uh, you know, no lawyer has ever found a problem that they didn't think they could multiply. So, it's, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's one of the great things. One of the things I think of, but and I really do think of it as the uh, as the original IFOA, because that was one of the great aspirational documents of all time. It was, I think, 180 pages or something. What is, I think of that as the bomb squad, right? What it does is it tries to get rid of all the obstacles that you're going to stumble across. And it really tries to take the Ian McNeil approach of relational contracting deeper. And, and people who, uh, you know, I've had long conversations with Greg about the relational contract. He, he was saying, oh, this is, this is really great. And I said, well, do you know how fundamentally it changes how we think about contracts? You know, how contracts from the common law and from Oliver Wendell Holmes, consideration and all these crazy things. It changes the entire changes the entire game to a game of reciprocity and not a game of, of victors. But we didn't come here to talk about contracts. We came here to talk yeah. about how you how you moved into the productivity part. So you, you met Will like Dig. He went off and drafted a contract. Tell me about Terminal 5, because uh, that's something that Glenn's eyes always kind of missed over when he talks about Terminal 5 and uh people that were on that project, including a guy I met here in Canada named Craig Swalberg. So he's just, same thing, eyes missed over about that. Tell us about that, that project, because I think it's a little bit under the radar in the community, and I think it was hugely important to what you guys later on did. 
Yeah, I think uh, Heathrow Terminal 5 is probably the, the greatest project that's ever been delivered from an innovation lean contract. It ticks all the boxes. Nobody's come close. Many have had an opportunity. But, you know, it's a, it's a very fascinating story. First of all, Sir John, he sells Jaguar to Ford. He gets knighted and they ask him to take BA and to make that a, uh, a private enterprise that's publicly traded. Just get it out of the government, right? And uh, he, gets, he gets there and is told, basically, we have to build this new terminal. Otherwise, either the French or the Germans are going to take the business because they're happy to build it. I Don't quote me on the numbers, but I think the, the, the valuation, the market cap for BA at the time was $3.5 billion. The project was $7 billion. And, and Sir John's smart enough, man. He's, a, he's, you know, he's knighted and he's saying to himself, how are we going to do that? He goes out, looks at some of their projects. He's absolutely appalled being a car man, as he would say. The level of discipline or the lack of discipline the lack of, of, of professionalism and all. So he decides to pull all of his contractors together and said, hey guys, we need to change. And they said, well, that's great, John, but you're just another job. And, and the projects that had happened in the UK along the way were just total carnage. I mean, really bad between Wembley and, and, uh, and the National Research Center and the rest. And so he decides to launch something and puts a guy who's a very important guy in the world of lean, a lot of people don't know who he is, is uh, Simon Murray, founder of Acumen 7 in the UK. Simon's group technical director at uh, BAA, and he goes out around the world looking for best practice. And uh, he goes down to Stanford. They find uh, my little company up in San Francisco and say, can you be on a plane next week to come to London? And so we said, sure. And actually, uh, uh, Greg and Glenn and I all went at the time and we did some, uh, some workshops for those guys after the, the, I think the initial meeting that, that I had gone to, if I remember. And what was interesting is they were trying to figure it out, but BA had one thing, they had a few things they were doing. One, they had a car man that knew lean. He knew lean manufacturing and, and he, he didn't know anything about lean construction. It hadn't really been invented yet, but he knew, he knew lean manufacturing. They had a contract that they had developed that uh, basically, and, and this can go either way, but what worked for them was they said, we're gonna guarantee your profit and they ring fence that, put that in a uh, in an escrow account, and they said we're going to take and go uh, direct cost, and we'll split any savings out of that, and half of it will go to you, right? So they had the contract thing worked out in advance. It's very famous, the T five contract. And then what we did, uh, and a lot of people don't know this, is we deployed production control throughout all the engineering, throughout the majority of the fabrication and the on site construction. So thousands of people are working in what was called at the time Project Flow, which was the software. Delivery every 28 seconds, 9-11 hits at the beginning of the project. So they're shutting down runways and, and, and starting runways and changing direction, which has huge problems for 120 tower cranes that are on site, yeah. right? And so very complex project, thousands of workers, delivery every 28 seconds, couldn't deliver in the morning or in the afternoon due to traffic. One day of laydown on site, amazing job, comes in ahead of schedule, under budget, Got a little bit of a black eye for the, the startup the initial launch when uh, they didn't have the car park sorted out the training, but the construction went great. And it's a, it's a fabulous case study that success story that many, many people want to quote that they were there. And uh, <laughs> if there was, there was, we still have our badges, uh, those of us that actually worked on the project. Oh, wow. So is, 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 is that where you got the, the kind of the fundamental idea to move from, uh, from Pacific to uh, SPS? Yeah. So uh, that's a great question. Exactly what happened was in 99, the, I believe it was the Department of Energy uh, came to LCI and said, uh, hey, we'd like to do some research with you guys, but you got to be a not for profit. And, and we had a meeting and the decision was made um, that we're going to be a not for profit. And remember, LCI is a for profit business. And I basically just took uh, what was considered the, the advisory consulting business and said, they said, you go do that. Glenn and Iris are going to Berkeley. Greg, you're going to be the, the, uh, the guy that goes out and spreads the word. And that's how we carved it up that day. Uh, at the same time, I just decided um, there's this opportunity in the UK and other places. I'm, I'm going to go do that. And that's when we launched, uh, I launched SPS, if you will. That's fantastic. That segues into um, directly kind of into the three eras, I think. Because yep. I think your, um, your graphic around that is very telling. It's just classic. I mean, I hadn't seen this before. And so era one is productivity, 1900 to 1950. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so a little bit of context on this, how, how this came to be. Just, I was out to dinner with a customer and this guy was running capital project for a large company. He said, uh, a Texan guy, Todd, I don't know how we got to where we were. And I go, Joe, that's a really interesting question. Went back and did some research 
I read 32 books in about three or four months. And this was years ago, and it kind of fried me, uh, believe it or not. But I really wanted to answer this question, how do we get to where we were? And after reading all this stuff, it came out that it was, it was obvious that there's basically been three eras of thinking about projects. Era one, productivity, very much focused in scientific management. Think of Taylor, Babbage, Gilbreth, and those guys. And there's a book. that This book's really interesting. You can buy this book where Frederick Taylor, who is the guy with scientific management, when you think of Taylor, think of... Uh, Gant, who worked for him with the bar chart, think about separation uh, from, from uh, the doing and the, and the planning. He had uh, eight foremen, the speed boss, the disciplinary boss, which maybe that's uh, HR now, the speed boss being accounting. Um, he really thought the workers were dumb and that if he could motivate them in the right way, they could get a lot more done. Now, of course, Gilbert had a different view on that. But Howard, he translates all of Taylor's work for construction, right? And at the same time, you have what we call the behavioral approach with uh, Follett and Owen, and then the administrative approach of the bureaucracy with fail and all those guys, right? So right. if you look at where we are today, right? And I'll tie a little bit of it together when we go to era two, but the goal was productivity. And we're really still focusing in the, we're still operating focus in the world of Frederick Taylor and those guys, believe it or not. If you're going out on a project, you're doing time on tool studies. If you're trying to make a worker, like you were saying earlier, go faster, and you're not attacking what we would call the queue time when we get over to the far right. If you believe that motivating workers are the key, if you have bar charts on your project, if you got one guy planning, another guy doing, you're deep into era one. And you may not even know it. Right. Yeah. There's a great book called The One Best Way that is a, a, a kind of lengthy biography about him. And, and, and they contrast Taylor and his like complete disparagement of workers uh, with Henry Ford, who you know, when, when he started doing his production system, he brought in the craftsman because he knew that he couldn't either train his workers or get people to do quality work if they didn't have pride in the work that they were doing. And Taylor just didn't give a crap about that. <laughs> I, Taylor says that he he worked with a guy named Schmidt, which was literally, he's, he said, the, the, the most ignorant, dumbest one he could find that was involved in the works and said he's going to work on Schmidt to prove that his system would work. And, and Taylor ends up in front of you know, some kind of congressional hearings because the railroad adopted this stuff and they want to know what the hell he was doing because they didn't think it worked. And people like Ford were very much different than, than where, where, where Taylor was. Yeah. yeah. So then we, we move into uh, era two and I, I, I certainly don't want to forget, you know, Lori Koskell is the main guy back in the 30s, Shrewheart, thinking yeah. about management and how that stuff goes. So let's, let's make a, a, a connection between those guys when we, but let's talk about era two first and, and see if there were some pioneers that helped us move into, into that. So yeah, so era, yeah, era two is interesting because it really starts with DuPont and, uh, and Remington Rand to those guys at UNIVAC. And so UNIVAC, Remington Rand UNIVAC comes out with the idea that we need some computers and, uh, and where can we go apply them? And so they go over to DuPont. DuPont said, well, you know, coming out of Manhattan Project, we've been working on this thing called the critical path. Maybe we could computerize that. And so critical path was really just like uh, materials requirement planning was a way to, for, for those guys to sell computers. And they developed a system, this, uh, this approach, and it was documented in a, uh, in a computer science paper back, back in the day. I think it was in maybe 59. I think 58 or 59, yeah. Yeah, 59, I think, by uh, Kelly and Walker. And at the same time, you know, the government's very frustrated because it's very Frederick, you know, it's very scientific managed Taylorism that's going on in projects. And these guys need to predict project outcomes for, uh, for congressional approval and budgeting, right? And right. so they actually institute the things around uh, performance evaluation review technique, earned value comes in, right? And uh, everybody's really trying to search for predictability. So they're, they're operating in Taylorism for productivity and search of predictability and they don't really understand the underlying things. And the government just builds this stuff out to this morass we have today. And I think, I think you know, guys like claims consultants back in the day, like Chip Hutchinson and these guys make an ungodly amount of money to apply uh, Eichley formulas to critical path schedules that have nothing to do with what happened on the project, right? Uh, uh, I, hired a, a, I hired a guy from Kellogg yeah. to, to be an expert witness in a case I had on critical path. And by the end of that case... I understood how completely flawed yeah. critical path was. And the yeah. jury went back, they spent a week developing their own critical path. I yeah. mean, it was, it was funny because it wasn't the longest item. They were thinking, well, what was the work that had to be done and, and who didn't get it done? And it was just, it was, it was beautiful. So it, 
you know, in 1978, I already knew the critical path was not what we wanted to do. Yeah. And, you know, just a note on that. So the, the Navy docks is quite, or they get quite excited about that critical path and they hire John Fondall again. We keep going back to Stanford, but everything comes out of there, uh, you know, including how, but uh, yeah. Navy docks hire Stanford to figure out what uh, those guys are doing with the computers. And he figures out the node on node network diagram in manual form. So he reverse engineers it. And then later when he's given a speech for the, uh, the, uh, I think the pure four award, maybe, he says, you know, of all this stuff going on a critical path, people need to understand, he used the word constrained or restrained, I forget, but he said uh, the resource, meaning in, in the world of operations, the capacity is going to set what's going to happen. And nobody pays attention to that. So however much labor equipment and space you have will dictate how long it's going to take, not some mathematical critical path equation. It was funny. I was just in a conversation this week about the critical path. And how could you try to develop a schedule based on long paths if in fact the most crucial work is tucked in there someplace and you don't even talk about it. And they go, oh, it's a critical path, you know, and it's still, I mean, it's, it's 2021. We're still talking about that stuff. So as you move from predictability, and I think this, I think this was an issue with the government, um, as you say, and it, it's also boards of trustees at colleges and universities. You know, people want to see what you're building and they want you to tell them how, how long it's going to take and how long it's going to cost. And none of that stuff is reliable until you actually know what you're building. But way before you're going to build it, they want you to know how long that stuff is going to, going to cost. So they, I think customers drive bad behavior in that area. And, and they've driven us to trying to figure these things out. And so they have these magical computer programs that actually just don't really do anything. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we, let, let's move into era three, what we call profitability. The idea yeah. there is we're, we're really doing this thing to be profitable. And, and, and that can be profit in the way of economic terms or profitable that society enjoys a new new road or lake or whatever on a civil infrastructure or healthcare facility. But you know what, what happened to us is when we started working at Heathrow Terminal 5, we, we brought over a guy that actually works for us now when we acquired factory physics named Mark Spearman. And Mark is probably one of, he is one of the leading authorities in the world on what we call operation science. And what Mark uh, was, was working on were these mathematical equations that explain, and, and we call it operation science, explain these relationships of what's gonna happen in any type of process. Now, let me just give you a couple of these and, and let you think about them. One, and, and so we say there's four verbs, right? And focus on the design, which includes uh, functional requirement definition, uh, concept design, detailed engineering, whatever the case may be, make, fabrication, manufacture, logistics, and transportation, and then your final construction, including commissioning. Focus on those verbs, right? Forget all the other stuff. Just focus on those four verbs. There's five levers, right? How you design the product, how you design the work process, how you allocate capacity, how you manage inventory, and I want to come back to that because this is critical and probably a huge opportunity. And finally, what happens with variability. And when we brought Mark over when we were on T5, we spent a uh, weekend with him. And it was just absolutely amazing because he was explaining to us the world of production like we've never seen. So let me give you one that probably is one of the most important things you'll ever hear when it comes to production. Inventory, especially work in process, not progress, work in process is the proxy for cycle time. So if you want to know how long it takes for a project to get done or how long it's going to take, you measure the whip. Hmm. So if you go on manufacturing and talk about inventory turns, inventory turns, inventory turns, economists talk about how much inventory is in the economy because it's telling you the throughput of the stuff, the velocity. So think about that. Inventory, especially whip, is the proxy for time. We could tell what time it is by looking at the inventory. This is profound. We actually, with a very high degree, can now predict the outcome of a project before it ever starts by looking at the inventory profile. Wow. Right. And so what we didn't realize we were doing, and what I don't think a lot of lean people fully understand is, and what Toyota did is what Toyota was doing is they were working on things that impacted the inventory. Right. And so what Mark did is he brought us this ability to understand, along with James Chu, who I've had the, the, the pleasure of working with since back in the contracting days, right, PhD at Berkeley under Glenn and Iris, is the ability to understand how to apply some fundamental algorithms to these projects by looking at them, that they're a production system, there's four verbs, there's five livers, and there's three curves. If you drive up utilization, you put more cars on the freeway, the cycle time is going to explode. 
right? Right. If you, if you take the thing too lean, you won't get any work done. If you right. build too much whip, you're going to get work done, but nothing, you're going to do work, but nothing's going to get done. Why do I say all this? Think about it. People are out doing time on tools. They're trying to get material out there too early. They're trying to start stuff they can't finish. They're doing earned value that drives you to do build more whip. And they wonder why this thing gets so sideways, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, there's so many great examples of that. I was on a project once where the, uh, it was an earned value management project and the, and the drywaller was up on the fifth floor because he could get the most work done and get paid the most as quickly as possible. And the elevators just sat there wanting the drywaller. Right. So there, there was no there was no sense of what what had to come together. These things just drive bad behavior in so many different ways. I mean, they're, they're always good things to take a look at. Um, and we have a very simple uh, and this is this is really interesting to me because, you know, we have a very simple way of looking at inventory in, in lean. And, you know, inventory is just waste. So, you know, it's got to show up just in time. We don't think of it as in the cycle uh, of the overall production. Yeah. So Why? what you yeah, what you were talking about earlier with the simulation is with the dots is in between the two events is the queue time. That's the whip, the stuff just right. sitting there. And you can't take it away because once you put the whip in, your aggregate amount of whip is equal to the aggregate amount of time or the schedule duration. And so people will do anything to start work. They won't finish it. As a matter of fact, the whole project is whip uh, on the part of the consumer that needs to go do something with it when it's done, right? Yeah. And so mass amounts of cash are tied up. Mass amounts of whip are created. It's the same thing. So whip is also the proxy for cash. As all this, so we could look at the cash profile. We could look at the, uh, the whip profile. It's going to tell us the time, right? And then what happens is guys are starting more and more stuff. They're using inventory to protect themselves amongst the other trade. Give me the whole floor and I can get done faster. Of course you can, but the project will take three years longer, right? right. All of that is going on because we don't have a fundamental understanding of operation science and how it applies to projects. As a matter of fact, let me tell you something that's scary. The Project Management Institute and the last version of the PMBOK actually said operations management is a knowledge set outside of formal project management, and it happens after a project's delivered, not a body of knowledge you could use during the delivery of the project. <laughs> exactly. And it, it, it's, it's funny because uh, I use the example of, uh, of Newton all the time um, and what we're talking about in terms of a changed paradigm. You know, the apple falls on his head and he's going to write a chapter for the book of knowledge. But the book of knowledge says the sun revolves around the earth and the earth is flat. You can't write a chapter about gravity in that book, just like you can't write a, a, a chapter about pro productivity in the PMI book of knowledge. I mean, it just doesn't it doesn't fit. It's all about driving from the back seat, Right. It's oversight. And, and what you do with oversight? Which, Administration. Yeah. It yeah. goes back to one. I, I would say. The world is flat is, is something that we like to use. And what we see is a lot of people are studying projects like the world is flat, trying to figure out when they're going to fall off or sail off. And what we're saying is, no, the world is round. You better be looking at your provisions because you're going to run out. You're going to starve to death. You're not going to fall off. And they it's, look at it and say, yeah, it's right. It's the doldrums that kill us, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you think about the doldrums as having, you know, no inventory just in time because you thought inventory was a waste and you didn't develop any inventory then all of a sudden you understand that you're out in the middle of the ocean with no provisions and no wind. And that's a good point because what a lot of people don't understand is you have to have some inventory. We want to be lean. We don't want to be anorexic. And we see people take yeah. the inventory too low and nothing gets done. We see people take, a lot of them take it too high. So the question is, how do you get to the right frontier? And that's kind of the area that we like spending our time in and get very excited about applying these, these algorithms on those problems. Well, and that's really what, uh, what you took into SPS, right? I mean, you yeah. got these process piping plants and you run the algorithm at the end of the day and the next day the schedule is all new. I mean, so yeah. you don't you don't have a six week look ahead. Right. You've got about a six hour turnaround time. <laughs> yeah, well, and let's add to that because maybe we could spend a couple of minutes on where all this might go and go. And so if you think about that, if we could build a model of the production system, that is the project. OK, right. and I'm, I'm not talking about a, put some post-it notes on the wall. I'm talking about a real model using uh, modeling language. Uh, and and uh, intelligent objects, we can now do some really interesting things. And let me just tell you a few things that I know that we're involved in. One, we can feed sensors into the model. IoT sensors, tracking from vehicles, autonomous vehicles, tracking from uh, marine and aircraft, right? Feeding into what's going on in real time, okay? This is just we taking also, what Qualcomm did and then taking it to the next level, right? Yeah, we could take... 
And we could feed that signal back out the other way and tell the thing to go do something, right? So that so now we have a data layer where we're communicating. Now, one of our customers has taken that to the next level and we're feeding into a data lake where they're now taking our stuff with some, some of the stuff we have with some of the stuff they have and we're doing machine learning, artificial intelligence, data science on top of that. So we've got the OS that tells us if we increase whip too high, time's gonna go out. If we increase it too low, time's gonna go out because we're starving. So that, that's the operation science. And then we have the data science that's querying the database to tell us what's causing the whip problem, right? And right. so what one of our customers is able to do is take daily real-time feeds coming out of the production control within an 88% accuracy predict the schedule duration. Wow. Okay. So all of a sudden the dream of the era two predictability people are starting to come together through the operation science and the data science. Right. And this is and not so, some, some guy in a closet filling in durations on P six. No, no. I mean, <laughs> the guy, the guy, I don't even know how the guy would keep up with what was, I, I got to tell you a story about T five though, really just a, just an offer. They have 88 planners on T five. They come to us one day and say, Hey, we'd like to use your production control. And we said, you guys are the planners. What do you want to do? They said, well, we've got to manage all the planners and get the schedules done. We said, <laughs> you're going to use production. Hey, true story, right? Anyway, so um, but so so think about how IoT, autonomous vehicles, IoT are going to start to come together, right? And then the other thing that we're spending a lot of time thinking about, and, and two big things happened in the last few weeks, uh, Warren Buffett invested in a uh, offsite fabrication company called MyTech or MeTech or something. And Katera obviously had to had to you know file the, the the reorganization or bankruptcy. Here's a question for people that really interests us: Should you assemble? Should you clearly you should fabricate offsite, but should you assemble onsite or should you assemble offsite? All right, think about that. Big movement to assemble offsite. Now, if you're building a um, uh, uh, a jacket and a topside for an offshore platform, you're probably going to want to do that onsite, right? Yeah. But there's there's a lot of guys trying to do work offsite. I want to just throw this out at you. In Today and Tomorrow, Ford's book on uh, Henry Ford's book, he talks about how he shipped the cars flat pack. He didn't want to ship there. He didn't assemble the cars. He sent them flat and they assembled them locally. IKEA ships flat pack. Okay. Right. So there's a lot of guys trying to do volumetric construction that are saying we're not seeing the cost savings. We're going, no kidding, because you're driving the whip up too high. Right. Right. Then you have people that are automating versus craft. We see people, we saw some photographs the other day where some guys took and they were doing the same work in a shop that they'd be doing out on site. And now you got the extra handling and preservation and all, right? So there's this really interesting point that we're at right now where it's a confluence of digitalization and industrialization, but it's all completely useless if you're stuck in era one and era two, because it doesn't benefit from that. You have to move to era three production. Well, and, 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 and your quality has to improve, right? Because, yeah. I mean, you can't do off-site manufacturer or off-site, even, even kit of parts necessarily, if your tolerances in the building are so bad that you're stick building it anyway, right? I've so been you, trying to say for years that Iris Tomline did an amazing piece of work on tolerances 20-something years ago that nobody to this day pays attention to. But if you want to get serious about any of this type of stuff, you need to go understand what Iris is talking about with tolerance because tolerance management is one of your highest priority along with joining. How do you join things? Are you welding it? Are you fastening? Whatever the case may be. And material science, right? And what's happening is as you move more to industrialized construction, where do you end up? You end up exactly where you should be back in mechanical, electrical, structural, engineering, material sciences, right? You get back in the game of where we should be back to the four verbs. And we start thinking about elements in construction and not, not trade centric, right? We start, exactly. we start thinking about the availability of the things we need to join. I mean, because right. construction is just the art of joining things really. Yep. Right. And, and where are you going to join it? So what are the tolerances in that thing that you're going to be able to join it in and how quickly can you get stuff there and get it installed because that's your constraint as right. well. So, so how does the, the, the theory of constraints and, uh, you know, rally to the uh, rally to the point where your bottleneck is and, you know, pulling the end on court, how does all that stuff fit into the kinds of things that you're doing? Yeah, it's all, you know, it's interesting stuff that, you know, we don't do anything with it because we're, we're at a deeper level in, in the science of it all, but we can understand the strategies. So once you understand the operation science, you could figure out what people are doing. 
um, you know, critical chains, chain, they're using a, a buffer to shield against variability and pack time scheduling is trying to reduce uh, process variability. And, you know, we, we understand them all. We don't really have a position or, or in it. We just understand the most fundamental aspects of the, of the equations and how you might be able to, to take advantage of those to make the right decisions. And I, and I tell people a story. We were involved with a guy in Ireland one time. He said, look, I don't care how much money you save me on the construction, I get an 80% tax break if I could get all the materials out here as soon as possible. We said, well, we better get all the materials out as soon as possible, right? <laughs> because that was the business driver, right? Follow the money, right? Yeah. And so, you know, it, lean to me is just an express expression of a production system. When, when you get to the Toyota stuff, we can understand what Toyota did. I, I would, I would <laughs> tell people to go read a book that will blow your mind that was on the uh, British system of manufacture. And it's exactly what Toyota did. And, you know, um, Toyota, is, they've given a lot of credit to Ford, but they ought to go back and look what the, the Brits were doing as well in flow manufacturing, right? But all it is at the end of the day is it's all about managing, you know, we, we call them the, the five levers. Right. How you design the product. And you said it very well. You said the, the, the joinery is critical, right? And the tolerance is how you design that's critical. And, and then the next thing is, the process to create it, do those together so you have concurrency. Then what you do with capacity and the way of labor equipment and, and uh, space, your capacity utilization. A lot of people don't know. You know what the capacity utilization is for Toyota in a plant? 60%. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> These people aren't at 90. And I don't know why the construction guys run around going, we got to drive up the capacity utilization. The right. whole class is 60, right? right. And then you have your whip control, your inventory control, and then what you're doing with the, with the variability factor. Anything else is just an out, you know, output of that stuff. And if you could get your head around that, it, it, it's pretty, pretty simple, right? Wow. Um, so that's, I think that's the, the, the way that, that we look at it. You know, we're not against any of that stuff. It's just it's kind of second, second, it's not first principle stuff. So in the, uh, we've, well, this has been awesome. We've already taken a lot of your time. Uh, but you you went on and you founded the Project Production Institute, right? With a couple other folks. And then when I when I was uh, going through Google and finding you there, it was like a secret club. It was like the Knights Templars. You know, and these are all-star people yeah. in, the, in the field, and I'd never heard of it. And I hear about a lot. Of, I hear about most stuff. So tell me a little bit about that if it's not too secret and there's not a secret no. handshake or whatever. No, and, and anybody can do with that. Yeah, no, anybody could join PPI that's uh, interested. You're you're welcome to join, and uh, we're doing a lot of interesting things. You know, I said at the beginning, the Lean Construction Institute was founded to focus on production, and they've gone off into other things that are probably equally important. But we're very much about the production stuff, and so we felt there was a need for that, and we we, we launched that. And there's some great people that are involved in, 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 in many different uh, companies and sectors, and it's open to anybody who's interested. It's free to join, right? And um, really what we're doing right now that we're super excited about is we have some serious research that we're doing with people like Phil Kaminsky at Berkeley and, and, and Ballard and Fisher down there at Stanford and, and Mark Spearman's leading that. We have partnerships with Cal Poly, Texas A&M and Stanford to teach this stuff in a certi certificate program, right? Nice. We have working groups. We have a working group for energy. We have a working group for shipbuilding and ship repair. We have a working group for launching for industrial construction. This on offsite thing, right? And so it's really a group of people that have come together that are saying, "I want to understand more about the production side of stuff. I, I, I get the contract side. I get the this, the that, the social. I, I'm I'm ready for the production, right? right? So I really appreciate you asking about that. And anybody who's interested, I, I would encourage you go in there we there's many papers there's glossaries there's people available get involved and uh you know hang out and attend some of the stuff yeah i was blown away by the casting characters so uh, tell true. me in I'm, I'm sending in my postcard tomorrow yeah yeah it's my 11 you need to be there you need to be there 11 dollars and 38 cents <laughs> um so so just in the time we have left what's what, what what's next for you what are you uh what, what are you looking forward to is that project production institute that is that you're is that going to be your, your swan song or are you like me? Uh, people don't retire. They just get better at what they're doing. Yeah, I think probably the difference between you and me is you get better. I don't know if I get better. I just get more patient. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm probably known as a guy that could get intense. But, uh, I, you know, I think that's a good question. That's something I'm sitting back and, and you caught me at a good time to ask that question. I'm not, I'm not really certain. Um, I, I got to be totally, totally honest with you. I'm very, dis I'm very disappointed and dissatisfied with the construction industry in general. Right. I think this idea 
that centralized planners have so much control and influence over what's happening. It's just absolutely crazy. I think people have made great strides to try to change that. I think that the construction industry is kind of under an attack now with the private equity guys, the venture capitalists are moving in on the industrialized construction offsite stuff and in the tech stuff. And uh, I think that they're going to start to to maybe change the agenda, maybe not. I don't know. But I just think it's to me that the, the, the saddest part is that a scheduler gets paid more than a structural engineer. And that to me is just you know, or bills out. That's just not right. Right. And so I'm trying to think about, you know, is this an industry that could really go get its act together or is it, is it just to the point where it is what it is and, and people have to suffer? It's the largest, probably one of the most important industries in the world, but it's just happy to keep the status quo for whatever reason. Well, you know, and, and until we start thinking about it as the built environment and we start thinking about it from cradle to grave, and we start thinking about the customers as more than just, you know, four or five different entities out there, but it really, it's the planet, it's the community, it's everything. What we do is so important that to do it so badly seems really wrong. Yeah, it's, it's just not, it's all right. And so I think maybe it's PPI, maybe, you know, PPI is probably my personal best vehicle is to continue to drive the need for the change. And I think you said something earlier, and that is project management focuses on what needs to be done by who, when. And that's a great thing for a transactional contract that's black and white. How you do it and where you do it, we don't know much about. And that's where the action is. And so people are moving work off site. People are adopting this thing to do that or whatever the case may be. They have no framework for understanding that. And maybe if we could work through digital tools to make it simpler for them such that they can make decisions that don't have the unintended consequences or have maybe it all made a difference right so well i think that's what we're looking to do you've certainly yeah. made a big difference my friend thanks for spending time with us i really appreciate you dropping in hey thank you very much dick it's been great and uh let's get together again when you have time we'll do it man thank you i gotta hit that wall of wine that you got at your your place <laughs> and share mine with you fun. yeah thanks brother cheers talk to you soon thank you Thank you for tuning in to the Lean Construction Blogs podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please help us spread the word by sharing, subscribing, or leaving a review on your preferred podcast listening platform. Remember to join us next time as we continue to lower the barriers to applying lean construction and help take your lean journey to the next level. And don't forget to visit the Lean Construction blog to stay up to date on our latest podcast episodes, weekly blog posts, monthly webinars, and upcoming conferences. We hope to see you on the next episode.